Assad in Moscow, beautiful community. Let's talk about this briefly um, because I have a health time limit in this Polish chair that um, allows us to meet. Now, we said two things last time that I actually think we're doing well in terms of. They were little warnings. The first is don't treat events in Syria as though they are unreal and actually just an event in a Western domestic culture war. And the second thing we said is understand that this ultimately kaleidoscopically evil regime being gone, kaleidoscopic in its torture and its surveillance and so on, is good, but that we can be worried and concerned about the future for Syria at the same time. I think in both these respects, generally the commentariat in the English-speaking world hasn't done too badly. Um, there hasn't been a kind of nauseating degree of um, thoughtless triumphalism, um, nor has there been any dramatic failure to acknowledge the evils of the Assad regime. So we haven't done too badly. So good marks for us. Let's not talk about Assad in Moscow. The Assad clan has lots of property in Moscow. Assad, being human, will now be thinking about his safety. Now you might think, well, he's just gone through this extraordinary, and we're going to do some tyrant empathy now, so buckle in. He's gone through this extraordinary event. Surely now must feel safe in Russia. No. Um, he'll feel safe, but he'll be thinking about his safety in Russia. He'll be thinking, how long will the Putin regime last? And what will I do after? Is it 10 years? 15 years? I'm going to be alive then. So where will I be and how will my safety be secured? And he'll even be thinking about things in the shorter term because of the visceral nature of what he's gone through. So he's thinking safety. Now, there's a lot of jokes about what Assad's going to do next. A lot of memes about how he's going to start a joint alt-right internet talk show with Steven Seagal. Jokes about how he's going to go into Russian politics, which are actually ludicrous, but are not jokes in a ludicrous category. Because if Assad were Lukashenko, he would actually go into Russian politics if he were confined to Russia. There is to be unrealistic but less unrealistic a thought that will be available to Assad, however. That's a, you know, a, a thought worth mentioning when it comes to his career. And that is, can I be engineered back into being tyrant of Syria three or four years from now, perhaps by the Russians? At this point, Putin will also be thinking about his own safety for two reasons. First of all, because he's witnessed what Assad's gone through, which will re-trigger for Putin his Gaddafi trauma and his Prigozhin trauma. And because Putin's aware that now coming into almost three years of war, Putin is still out of sync with sentiment in his country, out of sync with the depoliticized blob who have not remotely caught up to Putin's level of um, imperial mania and reactionary determination. And he knows that that's okay in the short term, but that it can't stay so in the medium term. And we'll talk about that on the main channel, Health Allowing, soon. Now let's do a poem by the late Clive James, which I'll link up below on Blue, um, Blue Skies and on X Twitter by the late Clive James, about Asma Assad. It's such a visceral poem, and we're on this platform that might not like it, so I'll only read about 30 to 40 percent of it. Let's do it. Wherever her main residence is now, Asma unpacks her pretty clothes. It takes forever. So much silk and cashmere to be unpeeled from the clinging leaves of tissue by her ladies. With her perfect hands, she helps. Bashar, her husband, does as he sees fit to cripple every enemy with pain. We sort of knew, but he had seemed so modern with asthma alongside him. I doted as Vogue did on her sheer style, 
Dear God, it fooled me too. So now my blood is curdled by the shrieks of people mad with grief. My own wrists hurt as asthma with her lustrous fingertips. She must have thought such things could never happen. Unpacks her pretty clothes. Lots of love.